Namaste. Well, long-time channel subscriber Sophie D. made a suggestion. Let me read you her comment. She says, It would be wonderful if you could do a video on the difference between Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta regarding the existence or non-existence of God, Brahman, and Ishwara, especially when it comes to the personal nature of God. Some Buddhist teachers say that God is simply a term, equivalent to what they call dharma. But in my experience, they deny the existence of a personal creator God. Buddhist teachers I have spoken to or heard, Theravada and Mahayana, also deny the existence of a divine will behind creation. If I understand them correctly, they consider creation to be ruled by natural laws, here again, the dharma, that is, impermanence and the cyclical nature of all formations. They regard new world systems as emerging from the karmic results of sentient beings who did not attain liberation at the end of the previous world system. Your insights on this difference of views would be wonderful to hear. Well, thank you. That's a great idea. And so let's do it. <laughs> First of all, I want to mention it's like winter in the middle of summer here. If you ever see me wearing a shirt, you know it's darn cold. <laughs> so it's rainy, windy, gusty, blustery, and cold. I think it went down to like 22 last night. That's like winter. Anyway, nobody has ever asked me why I don't wear a shirt. Although some people have complained about it, <laughs> they never bother to ask why. And the reason is that when a Brahmin priest is engaged in sacrifice, jagna, they always go shirtless to signify their role as a servant. So this is why Ramana Maharshi never wore shirt or pants or dhoti. <laughs> and this is why if you go to a temple in India, you will always see the priest making the offerings at the altar shirtless. So here, we are making the sacrifice of Vedic sound vibration, Shabda Brahman. Therefore, we, uh, unless there's some, you know, extreme weather conditions, we don't wear a shirt because we are actually a servant of the Vedas. So now to the question. Every question like this, that involves comparison between two different systems is a minefield because the systems define their terms differently. So we could be talking about creation, existence, and non-existence in the Vedic system using one set of terminology, but it doesn't really address the concerns or the themes of Buddha's teaching. Now, this is complicated by the degeneration of both the Vedic and the Buddhist system in recent centuries. Probably the last time that Buddha's teaching was producing significant numbers of enlightened beings was over a thousand years ago. He himself predicted that his dispensation would only last 500 years. Why? because of admitting women as monks or nuns. Women are not supposed to renounce. In Vedic terminology, there is no such thing as a sannyasini. Yeah, there's some women's lib types that appropriate the title Swami or Swamini, but they are actually rebels and they're at odds with the Vedic system, which is similar to, you know, cutting off the branch you're sitting on. <laughs> So anyway, these two systems are completely different in their terminology, in their structure, in their even in their logic. So what we have to do is to zoom all the way out and look at everything in terms of consciousness. Now, I know you've seen this good old chart a bunch of times. That doesn't make it any less true. And in my experience, most people just don't get it. The various religious and spiritual systems focus on 
different areas of consciousness or different states of consciousness. For example, ordinary external religion focuses on jagrat consciousness. Bhakti, which imagines a personal god and a system of worship and so on, devotional service, concentrates on the consciousness of svapna, dreaming or thinking. And then Buddha's teaching, as also Patanjali's yoga system, concentrates on cultivation of sushupti consciousness. And finally, Vedanta, in its purest form, Kevala Advaita, concentrates on development of Turiya consciousness. So, of course, the observations, the processes, and even the vocabulary of these different systems is going to be really incomparable. They can't be compared with one another because they're talking about two different states of consciousness. Now, the Buddha, his teaching, I, I, I ignore everything written in the so-called Buddhist tradition after about uh, 1,500 years ago because it's all contaminated with politics and uh, the divorce of Buddhism from the Vedic culture. And I mean, there's so many side plots going on that it's very difficult to get to the actual essence of the teaching. You have to go all the way back to the original Buddha suttas and not the ornamented, elaborated, decorated, fabricated versions of the Mahayana, but the original remembered versions of the Theravada system, which were written down shortly after Buddha's death. So the Buddha's style of teaching is called, come here and see for yourself. In other words, try the teaching, do the practices, get the result, and then let's talk about it. In other words, he did not advise, he did not support philosophical discussions leading to the acceptance or rejection of his teaching. He was like, get the experience, then you'll know. So he didn't talk a lot about the results of his teaching. He talked much more about how to do it. And other people later on added all this philosophical cruft of, you know, does God exist? Does nature exist? You know, what is the cause of the universe, the creation, blah, 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 etc., etc. Now you have to understand, the yogic process on the platform of sushupti is meditation, neti neti, trying to reject everything that's conditioned, relative, or has qualities, leading to realization of pure sushupti, emptiness or nothingness. In that state, Brahman manifests spontaneously, and you have the sudden enlightenment. You have the self-realization spontaneous from the platform of the purified mind and intelligence. So that leads automatically to Turiya consciousness. Now, the Vedic system, on the other hand, has to remain backwards compatible, as it were, with the other systems of Jagna, Bhakti, and Yoga. So it can't make up a new category of terminology and philosophy automatically. What it has to do is show that this idea of Advaita evolves naturally out of the previous layers of ideas. And this is brought to a head, really, in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is also a deep subject and probably deserving of a whole series of videos. But basically, the idea of Bhagavad Gita is to show the difference between the path of action, karma, and the path of knowledge, jnana. So jnana yoga is the natural means on the platform of sushupti consciousness. 
karma yoga and bhakti yoga are the natural means on the path of action. The path of action is preliminary because it purifies a person of selfish desire. And then when they get to meditation, they don't have all these desires popping up and ruining their concentration. So the whole idea is to become qualified. How? Through performance of jnana and bhakti. This is why Shankaracharya established so many temples. And he also created a system of worship called the Archana Padati, which is still the basis of the worship in practically all the temples in India. The only exceptions I know of are the Tantric temples in Kajarago, and they're really wild. <laughs> but anyway, when you look at you know, the top-level view based on consciousness, it's very clear. Buddha's teaching is optimized for meditation. Shankaracharya's teaching is optimized for self-realization. But because Shankara's teaching had to be backwards compatible with karma and bhakti, it also includes elaborate explanations of how Brahman becomes covered by upadis, including the Ishwara upadi, that Brahman thinks, oh, I am the Lord of the universe. I am the controller and enjoyer of everything. I know all. I am completely powerful. <laughs> Like that. Whereas we have the jiva upadis of, oh, I am an atomic spiritual soul. I am an individual with a small limited identity. I am this body. I am these names and forms and so on. So these upadis are the explanation of how Brahman becomes covered. Now, from the Buddha's perspective, this is all unnecessary. Throw it all out, neti neti, to the extreme. And if you read his descriptions of the seven jhanas, especially the uh, supramundane jhanas, I'm sorry, the eight jhanas, they all involve a rejection and denial of form and name leading to realization of emptiness, shunyata. So this is totally a matter of, how could I say, the preferences of the various states of consciousness and how they manifest in a teaching, which then only later on becomes solidified into a philosophy. So you could say the later writers of both the Vedic and the Buddhist traditions are off. Why? Because they're too much attached to the names and forms, too much attached to these old fossilized structures. And they're not enough experienced in the actual process of self-realization. So they try to describe it from a mental platform, a verbal platform, which is completely inadequate. Because, for example, in the process of neti neti, if you're throwing out all verbal cognition, then how can you describe in words whatever comes next? <laughs> the absolute is inconceivable by nature. Because conception requires a conceiver, a person with a mind and thoughts and words and symbols used to construct those thoughts and so on and so on and so on. The whole bag of dualistic creation. And similarly, the Buddha's teaching is mostly just sales talk to get you to do the practices. Once you do the practices, then you'll know, and then words aren't necessary anymore. But because the Vedantic teaching has to interface with the rest of the Vedic teaching, it uses an elaborate system of commentary that explains the relative position of the different practices and teachings as regards the four states of consciousness. This is the key to everything. If you understand consciousness, 
you can understand everything else, including the most abstruse and esoteric teachings of any tradition and the relations of the traditions to each other. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>